All right, thanks everybody. Um, it's great to be here and uh, get some, some time with everybody. Um, so I, uh, you know, I don't know how many people were here earlier for Marianne's presentation, but um, so Marianne has a very big responsibility across Oracle for all Oracle products. Um, I don't know if I'm getting some feedback there or what. My, uh, my job is uh, much more focused. Uh, so I only have to worry about the Java platform. <laughs> That's all. Um, so my background is, um, is really programming. Um, you know, I did programming for many years and had an opportunity to kind of segue into security. And I realized, um, you know, everybody kind of comes from a different perspective. Some folks are um, IT firewall guys, system administrators. You know, we all, I think to be a security expert means that you were an expert in another area before you got to security. Um, so I joined uh, Oracle from, from Yahoo. Um, uh, so we're going to talk about a lot of different things here. Um, just kind of level set a little bit about Java, because uh, uh, since we do come from different backgrounds, um, you know, like myself, I'm more familiar with Java SE and things like that. Um, you know, but uh, everybody else might have different familiarity. Talk a little bit about uh, security at Oracle and how we do things there, and uh, may or may not be the same as how you do things. Um, we're going to talk uh, about uh, some of our uh, security remediation work that we've been doing in Java on the platform, um, as well as uh, some work in uh, different security features that we've been doing that perhaps, you know, you've seen the different articles about Java security in the news, but, you know, maybe you haven't seen, uh, you know, what we've been working on for features and things like that. Um, talk a little bit about some of our industry outreach, uh, things that we're doing, things, you know, areas where we've participated in industry and things like that. And as well as uh, at the end, just kind of conclude with, uh, you know, follow-up resources, uh, things that you can find out, um, you know, more about Java security and how uh, that might apply to what you're doing. So uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting about Java here is, um, is it's very open. You know, I guess a lot of folks would say that we're not open enough with Java. Um, you know, I totally get that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we're a lot more open than, um, you know, anywhere else I've ever worked. And some of that openness um, creates challenges that are, I've never had to deal with before. So, for instance, um, you know, if we look at, um, you know, kind of captured the different layers here. So we've got one layer of, like, specifications. Those are kind of the rules that define Java, what Java will be. We've got um, implementation layer, and that is um, for those that implement a version of um, Java according to the spec. Um, that would be like the binaries like JavaAC and things like that. And then uh, also we've got um, open source. Um, so when we get done our features, our changes, our improvements to Java um, for our implementation, we check it into the OpenJDK project uh, just like um, you know others do. It's, so everything from top to bottom here is, is uh, much more open than I'm used to. And, and in fact, even creates some challenges at times too. You can imagine, uh, you know, not just the security features that we deliver or the Java features, but anytime uh, we deliver a vulnerability fix, that gets checked in as well. So that's why, uh, so, you know, some of these uh, security vulnerabilities and things have to be taken seriously when we, uh, when we do patching. So, you know, where is Java? Um, I got this from um, some marketing information that we had because I just, I wanted to know myself. I'm, kind of buried in the trenches, so where is it? Um, so obviously we're on a lot of desktops, a um, lot of different devices here, and a really huge community. But it was just kind of interesting for me to actually get the numbers on that um, as well. So from a, from a policy perspective, so we, you know, we're going to kind of go through here, as I had mentioned, on, um, you know, how we do security here. And, uh, you know, one of those is um, security policies, which a lot of those policies are um, open. I don't know if there's a loose microphone around here or what. I feel like if I step in the wrong spot, everybody's eardrums won't be the same again. Um, so we've got some larger policy areas that, um, that really uh, govern Oracle and also include um, Java as well. So communications, uh, remediation, 
also um, policies that drive uh, the development life cycle and integrating security with the life cycle. So looking at uh, communications, um, so we have, uh, uh, you know, whenever we uh, publish a, uh, an emergency sort of fix, uh, we call those security alerts. Usually those are given in response to uh, active exploitation of Java, um, like on desktops and things like that. Um, so in response to that, we'll usually issue a security alert. Um, you know, a lot of uh, folks have said, you know, they, they want more proactive notification and things like that when the alerts happen. Uh, we do have RSS feeds and things that you can subscribe to that provide that information to you as it happens. Uh, the other thing is we, uh, for more normal sort of patching on security, we have uh, what we call CPUs, which are critical um, patch update advisories. That's the Oracle security patch. So if you thought you knew what a CPU was, you'd be wrong. Um, e-blasts, which are e email sort of notifications. Um, we do have uh, blogs and things like that. We have a Java, uh, a, a Java PM blog, which we've been using a lot for security to communicate uh, security news to the public. So you, uh, you know, in release information, uh, anytime that we, you know, come out with a new version of Java, there's release notes and things like that. Those describe all the uh, command line parameters and things that, uh, you know, from a technology or a technical level are good to know about the new feature um, that's being delivered. But it often doesn't describe like, okay, so here's this new feature, like what does it really mean to me and how do I use it and how does um, this thing that it's fixing, you know, what are the impacts um, to my software? And those are the kind of uh, things that we like to cover on the security blog. And so, uh, so we've been doing a lot of activity there and it's starting to get some traction. Uh, you know, the other thing that I like to cover too, and just to level set a little bit, I gave, um, there is some information here that I also gave in uh, AppSec, uh, OWASP AppSec EU in uh, Hamburg, Germany, uh, back in, I think, August. But it's really a message that I intended to kind of deliver in both places. So if you were in Germany, you might say, hey, I saw some of this stuff there too. So. Um, from a security policy perspective, communications, a lot of times, you know, I've been asked, uh, um, you know, hey, um, you know, why, you know, I saw this article about so-and-so and it's saying this vulnerability in Java, is this the, the vulnerability over here that you just released in your, uh, you know, in your documentation? Um, so I think, uh, you know, or why don't you guys talk about these things? Why don't you, you know, share more news about your vulnerabilities and things? Well, we'll kind of get into We've already talked a little bit about communications and what we're sharing, but there are, um, you know, there are certain reasons why, um, you know, we don't really respond to alleged vulnerability reports and that communication goes through official channels and things like that. And number one is just, um, you know, corroborating information out there before we're ready to release it provides, um, you know, attackers, uh, you know, uh, confirmation, positive confirmation. So that, that wouldn't be good. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, we do a lot on uh, social media and things like that. But I, I resist, uh, and, I, and I actually, am a, I'm, I have the Twitter account, and I do a lot of tweeting and things. I try to resist every temptation to, you know, release any kind of news over, you know, over social networks. Just because it, if we do that, it really forces everybody to monitor social media to get their, you know, job of vulnerability information. We really want to, you know, encourage people to go to official Oracle, you know, resources um, to find their news. I think it's, it's a much better way to deal with things. What I will sometimes do, though, is when we do release official news, I will, you know, maybe I'll just kind of write a quick blog entry that points to it or tweet about something else that's already official on an Oracle site. Um, but anyway, so these are kind of some of the questions that I've been asked before. Um, you know, why don't we talk about these things? Um, so in any case, we, um, you know, provide things through official channels and, uh, and we notify everybody at the same time um, so that, you know, it's all actionable and, and precise. So regarding remediation, we use a lot of um, uh, standardized uh, practices. So for, um, for ranking our vulnerabilities, you know, we want to, 
if we have a vulnerability that's particularly egregious, um, you know, we need a way to compare that to another vulnerability that you know, maybe is much harder to exploit or takes a combination of different vulnerabilities to really do something with that. So we use um, the CVSS system for uh, ranking those vulnerabilities according to you know, the, the risk. Um, a, a low score like a zero would be um, you know, very low or almost no risk, whereas um, say 10 would be complete fire drill. Uh, so we have a, you know, when we receive reports from the public, um, they're collected at a special uh, centralized location at Oracle, um, secalerts underscore us at oracle.com. Um, some of that information will be provided later as well. Um, but, the, you know, there's some basic uh, information gathering that happens at that point at which it uh, then flows down to the Java team. Um, we will triage the vulnerability, whatever it is, because we can't assume that something that is um, reported is even correct, right? Sometimes there's uh, ambiguity and standards and things like that where something might look like a vulnerability, but it's really a, you know, an, a, you know ambiguity in the protocol or could be almost anything. Uh, if it is a true vulnerability and it can be duplicated, then we assign it a CVSS score and begin tracking it, target it for a CPU that sort of thing. Uh, okay, so we talked about CPUs, our security patches. They're the regular sort of patching that we do. Um, and all the dates for the CPUs are published a year in advance. I'll provide those dates later in the presentation as well. Security alerts, we said those are the emergency sort of patches to deal with active exploitation. So I showed this to somebody at one time. You know, I think one of, one of the things that I want to communicate is, is this is certainly not a comprehensive list of everywhere that we plug in in the, in the development methodology. Um, I think uh, you know, one of the things that I'd like people to see is that you know, we are concerned about the entire development life cycle. Um, but I know in talking with somebody, they said, oh, you know, it looks like this is like a line, and we're really like an agile shop. And, so to me, this looks like kind of old stuff. That's what you're telling me. <laughs> so I think, uh, and actually, we have different methodologies for uh, the Java products, depending on where, where you're working, right? So when you're, uh, we have everything from people checking in, individuals in the public checking in fixes into the OpenJDK project in the public. We have uh, uh, developers uh, internal to Oracle on the Java team uh, working on uh, checking in code. So there's a lot of different processes, it's uh, very complex, but I think the point here is that, you know, we are, you know, we adopt industry best practices and apply different, uh, uh, you know, techniques and things to different phases of life cycle. Uh, the other thing that Marianne kind of talked about a little bit in the previous presentation was uh, some of the corporate teams that we have, um, ethical hacking teams and stuff. Uh, so uh, outside of the, um, the Java development team, we have more corporate teams that are kind of the spot checkers. Um, so we have ethical hackers that can kind of just come in and tear up things in the middle of a, a release cycle or, you know, uh, coming to the end to, you know, checklist to make sure things have been done, uh, that we've uh, gone through the proper procedures that we've needed to, that sort of thing. Um, we have, uh, as Marianne mentioned, we have security training for um, developers and things like that. On the Java team, it's, uh, we have some very specialized training because working on a platform is not the same as working on an application. So as you can imagine, you know, um, there's a lot of really mainstream commercial tools and things like that, analysis tools that are probably very effective for working on applications, you know, Fortify and things like that. Those things don't typically work very well for us because, as you can imagine, if we just take a look at Java 8, for example, um, you know, we have new features in there like lambdas and things, and the current analysis tools don't really understand some of those new language features, so <laughs> it wouldn't really work qu quite well out of the box. Um, but we definitely do use, um, you know, some of those tools. We just have, you know, their use in certain places. So we'll kind of uh, talk a little bit about um, remediation. So I think um, I think what I'd like to do, one of the things I'd like to do is just kind of share a little bit about what our position is on security. Um, 
very lightly. <laughs> I think the best that I can hope for here is to really uh, show everybody what we're doing and just leave it up to you to understand if it's you know, good enough, you know, if it's progress for you, that sort of thing. Uh, if we're on the right track, is it the same sort of things that you're doing? But I will say that um, you know, for Oracle, Java is a very strategic platform. Um, Oracle has many products, I think around 3,000 products or so. Um, Java is very important to Oracle products, just like it's important to your products. Um, I, I would wager to say many of the same troubles and challenges that you would have on your products with Java, Oracle has those as well. Um, so I think safety and you know, security is really uh, it's a top priority. Um, and it has uh, complete executive oversight. So I know Marianne kind of sells herself very softly as asking dumb questions and things like that. I will say she asks very tough questions. Um, and I've been a party to some of those. Um, so what is Oracle doing in Java security? Um, we're really focusing a lot on applets. And I think um, you know, I've kind of taken some of the public information that we have that actually you can kind of gather up yourself. Uh, if you wanted to, but perhaps I'm, you know, showing it in a new way. But it, what it's going to show is that, uh, you know, a lot of these things that you might have seen with Java in the news are really um, geared around Java applets and things like that, and don't really necessarily apply to um, server technology or some of these other uses. Um, so, in addition to defending applets, um, also accelerating remediation. So. You know, making sure we get all those Java bugs fixed and upping our efforts uh, on that front. You know, the faster we can get those things fixed, um, the less time hackers have to like reverse engineer these things and put them into exploit kits and things like that. Uh, in addition to all those things, developing new security features and countermeasures to um, to make Java stronger. You know, Java's been around for a long time. I guess since 1995-ish or so, and uh, you know, and we need to uh, some new security features to deal with some of these sort of threats that we're seeing out here are are definitely required, and we've been doing it, and we'll share some more of that. I think the other thing that I'd like to to communicate is one of our sort of strong actions here uh, in security recently. Um, uh, we were targeting uh, Java 8 um, for around, I guess, the Septemberish, Octoberish time frame. And in, it has been um, kind of pushed out here to um, the first quarter of 2014, uh, really due to um, doubling down on security. So I think uh, I don't think I've ever been in a company before where we've demayed, uh, delayed a major product uh, due to security like this. So to me, that's a that's a pretty strong statement. Okay, so on with uh, vulnerability uh, remediation tempo here. So. Across the, uh, across the bottom, I have some sort of uh, rough date swags. And then um, going uh, up the uh, y-axis on the left-hand side, um, that would be like number of vulnerabilities remediated. And then at each of the data points along the um, graph here, I have just kind of some release uh, swag. So if you're you know, kind of track our releases for your data centers and things, you have an idea of where these things fit in. Um, the little call-out box about CVSS zeros is um, to keep uh, engineers on the Java team happy because they, we don't include uh, as... Uh, so when we release these numbers um, to the public about um, Java vulnerabilities and vulnerability information, we do not include um, vulnerabilities with a CVSS score of zero. So what that means is actually there can be more things that we fixed than we reported. Um, so I think the, the point of what you, I guess what I'd like you to see on this graph is if we start in the, um, you know, the June of, uh, of 2012 time period, you know, in 7U5, we were doing about, you know, say, um, you know, fixing, uh, delivering about 15 vulnerability fixes in that time period, um, kind of building up a little bit more to uh, 7U9. And then in the 7U15 time period in February, um, we actually had um, two back-to-back -back CPUs, which was uh, uh, kind of put me on the hot seat a little bit there. Um, people don't like to apply back-to-back -back patches. We, we totally get it. Um, so what you're seeing there is there's just one data point at 7U15. It's just really to, to show the progress. Um, 
uh, even though there were two CPUs, there's just one dot there, so it's about 55 um, uh, vulnerabilities that were remediated there in February. And then we kind of dip down a little bit and then go back up to um, 7U45, which was a uh, recent release that, um, that we just came out with. But as you can see, the, uh, the remediation tempo is significant compared to where it was about a year ago. Um, remediated vulnerabilities by uh, component subtype is um, uh, when we publish the uh, CPU, the risk matrix, um, it includes um, the data about each individual vulnerability and then which component or package area that it applies to. Um, so say it might be in Java 2D or it might be in um, like uh, JNDI like you see on the side. Um, so I went through um, all the different risk matrix and put the data in Excel and kind of shifted the sieve to see what came out. And you can see kind of like the number of vulnerabilities that we've had over about the last year or year and a half, something like that, um, fall into the different categories. And so you can see like on the left-hand side, deployment is, um, is quite high and that's, that's the area where applets are at is deployment. Same thing with um, 2D you know, technologies that you would use, um, use on the client with applets, AWT. And then of course it kind of fades off into the noise level as you get down to the right. Um, same thing here, we don't include CV CVSS zeros. Um, so the other thing I should bring up too is um, if you've been kind of tracking Java for a while, um, Previously, we've had uh, three patches per year. Um, we've just recently uh, moved to Oracle's uh, CPU patching model, so we now have four per year, and we're on the Oracle um, patching timeline. So um, whatever you see there, we're just another product like all your other Oracle products. I think you know, thinking about things from a customer perspective, um, you know, if I were running a data center and testing other Oracle products and wanting to deploy them and I had to schedule like a downtime, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to test like say, you know, EBS or forms or something like that and then test Java in a, another CPU in a separate time. So by, you know, adopting the, um, the same CPU um, as larger Oracle products, I think there's benefits there for, for customers. For my own greedy security perspective, I get one more, um, you know, time where I can deliver fixes too, so. Um, okay, so we'll just kind of segue from remediation into some of the recent security features that we've delivered. Um, so in the uh, 7U10 timeframe in December, um, we, you know, there were a lot of concerns uh, at that time about, you know, disabling Java and things like that and how do I do that. And it was, uh, you know, one of the great things about Java is the fact that it's cross-platform and you can use it on your Mac or Windows and things like that. But unfortunately, not having a way to easily turn off Java kind of worked against us because the way you would tell somebody how to do it on Mac is different than Windows. And so it really worked against us. So rather than talk each, uh, you know, platform uh, user through how to do this, we figured, hey, why don't we just add a little tick box to disable Java and just make it easy. So if, uh, you know, IT people are concerned, you know, yeah, you cannot install it. That's, that's using a big hammer, but maybe they just want to turn it off temporarily. Um, so now you have that capability. Um, also in 7U10 in the December-ish timeframe, um, we added a, um, a facility for the JRE to understand when it's out of date. Um, because of the fact that CPUs are scheduled ahead of time, um, we can actually bake a date into the binary. And we know that um, in addition to contacting Oracle servers, but, um, but the point is, is uh, we understand people have firewalls and things like that. And if um, Java can't contact Oracle servers, it'll still know that um, it's out of date um, when that hard-coded date is exceeded. And the point is, is uh, by doing that, to understand that, um, to make the assumption that we are going to hit a CPU uh, at a certain date and that that CPU will deliver some vulnerability fixes. So therefore, Java can understand that it's now operating insecurely. Uh, and it may continue to operate still, but that um, perhaps there's certain actions and things that would um, be communicated to the user 
with increased risk because Java knows that it's now vulnerable. Um, the other thing that we did in 7U10 is add support for a security slider, um, allowing end users to kind of balance their operational versus security concerns. As you can imagine, when you tighten up on security, um, turn up the dials, you know, you make things a little bit more restrictive, you may mandate um, code be signed and things like that, and maybe you are not quite ready for that environment, so you need to operate at a lower level. Um, so that's what the slider is all about, letting uh, users um, have the ability to kind of manage their own risk um, versus, um, you know, operational versus security risk. Uh, one of the things that we learned in 7U21, uh, so security is a journey, right? <laughs> and sometimes, Sometimes you do things and they don't go as you expect, and that's really what happened here. Uh, so we had all these different um, shades of security on the slider, and one of the things we realized is that users just said, eh, I'll put it all the way to low or custom. And, uh, and then, which is great, uh, they had the ability to do that. It makes them much more, um, you know, places them at higher risk, especially when using old software, and then they would be exploited and then, you know, call us and, uh, you know, not be very happy. So what we did with that is um, we eliminated the low and the custom setting. Uh, so while it might look kind of strange that medium is the lowest, um, it really is because that's the lowest, uh, you know, the, the lowest established baseline that we want to go to. Um, and so, so that's what we did. We had to remove a couple of um, uh, settings there. We also added support for, um, expanded support for dynamic blacklisting in uh, 7U21. It's uh, mostly a feature uh, where vendors um, might call, uh, call us to say that they have some jars that they've shipped with their product, that uh, they know these jars are vulnerable, um, and can we blacklist them for them? Um, so it's, a, it's really a, more of an IT feature. Um, Signing for sandbox applications was uh, pretty pivotal. Um, I, you know, I think the biggest thing with, with uh, this feature here is it was really, um, it, it, it was a significant change to the security model. Um, prior to this, um, establishing permissions uh, was also part of code signing. And so I, in working with the Java team, I said, well, hey, look, this isn't, this isn't the way industry, you know, really does it. Uh, code signing, you know, establishes identity of the author, um, you know, um, maybe some enforces some accountability, things like that. Uh, code signing shouldn't be establishing permissions. We should handle that separately. So uh, that's what we did in 7U21. We um, made some changes to, uh, to encourage code signing. And then we also pulled out the part of uh, assigning permissions or privileges, um, what's sandbox versus not sandbox, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that we had to do is since we were encouraging code signing for, um, for Java applets is um, we needed to have our revocation services up to snuff. Um, so, you know, you can imagine, um, uh, so revocation services, in case you're not familiar, are the, um, uh, are what you would use to check to see if a digital certificate is still valid and that sort of thing. So if somebody signs some code with a certain digital certificate that identifies himself, um, we can then, when that program is run, call CRL and OCSP servers to see if that certificate is still valid or if it's been expired or perhaps it's been revoked because the, you know, there are some people that do bad things with certificates or sometimes the bad guy will steal the private certificate and then can sign some other code too. And uh, so that's why having uh, revocation services working uh, fully operational um, is very important. Previous to this, they were, they were there, but they were turned off by default. And the history behind that is that um, some of the vendors, um, the different CAs that provide these services, um, you know, had performance problems when we turned it on for millions and millions of desktops. Um, so we had to uh, contact the people that are in our root program and do some sort of interoperability testing with revocation services and things. And then in 7U25, um, turned, turned it on by default. So it's, it's on by default today. Um, the other thing that we did in response to um, working with, uh, 
government agencies and things is add some provision to uh, lock jars to specific servers or domains. They had some concerns about um, people downloading a jar and then repurposing it for something else. And then another significant feature I'd like to highlight is um, uh, deployment rule set, which we delivered here recently in 7U40, is basically uh, whitelisting for enterprise and um, corporate uh, partners that you might have. Um, so say, say you're having some, uh, you know, concerns about applets and applets being used on the internet. Um, you can add certain policies to DRS and deploy those to your um, enterprise desktop assets to prevent them from loading Java used in advertisements on sites that they visit. Uh, instead, limit those Java applets only to be run from your corporate servers or perhaps servers that your partner has. Of course, it's possible that your servers are exploited. Um, you know, so it's not, you know, but it helps to limit the risk, I guess. If you, you know, if you limit your desktops to um, just your corporate assets, well, you, you know how you manage your assets. You know what your policies are. Your assets are, you know, within the, you know, confines of your data center, surrounded by, you know, lots of expensive security control. So we think it's a, a nice uh, way to uh, let enterprises take charge of, of their risk and manage their risk accordingly. Um, so the other thing that uh, we had to add, another security lesson learned here, was. Um, a lot of enterprises didn't appreciate us popping up warnings that Java was now insecure and vulnerable on all their corporate desktops. Uh, imagine that. Um, unfortunately, uh, we had to, we couldn't just turn the message off right there. We really had to follow it with the DRS feature that allowed them to um, kind of mitigate some of that risk. So we had to kind of introduce the feature that turns off this dialogue along with DRS and just let manage, you know, let enterprises manage their own risk. Um, Java uninstaller, um, you know, one of the things that we've learned along the way is, uh, you know, old versions of Java are vulnerable and there's a lot of old versions that are installed out there. And so we are continually working on our uninstaller to, um, to improve it and try to get rid of some of those older versions where we can, where we can clean them up. And so that's, that's what the uninstaller effort is all about. Uh, Jack's P improvements, uh, you know, anytime you have uh, um, vulnerabilities in XML frameworks and things like that, they're um, not good because, uh, you know, for one, a lot of those, uh, that processing occurs before your program is even engaged. Um, so uh, they're kind of significant. So we added some fixes there too. Okay, so from an outreach perspective, uh, you know, where do we participate? Um, you know, we've done a lot of podcasts this year, um, outreaching on security. Um, I spoke at uh, DevOps in London uh, in the spring, and I was, uh, thank you to Jeremiah Grossman and Black Hat team, but I was invited to speak to uh, 120 uh, technology leaders from around the world at Black Hat um, over the summer. Never hurts on your resume, I guess. Um, thanks, Jeremiah. Uh, I uh, spoke here recently, uh, back in August or so, uh, at OWASP at SecEU in Germany. Um, uh, I spoke at, um, well, here now, of course, and uh, Java One in San Francisco, which is Oracle's uh, event for Java, and we've got some interesting news to share there, too. I'll kind of come back to that. Um, we have a, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, a Java PM blog, which we've really um, kind of uh, taken over for security purposes. Um, but uh, we've come out with a lot of um, good articles that we think would be, that, that we think are helpful and kind of fit the gap of, you know, we, we're not trying to redo all our technical documentation that comes with all the different releases for Java. It serves a good purpose, but if you want to push beyond the technical docs that come with Java and learn more about how these security features have impacts to the products that you develop on, um, this might be a good resource. Or if you're managing data centers and um, you have some concerns about how do you get these different features to be compatible with different versions of Java and things like that, those are things that are hard to get from technical documentation in Java. Uh, so we think that, that this will be a good resource. And there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of other people that uh, 
leave comments on these different blog posts and you know perhaps some of those comments kind of align with challenges that you have um, people are people are pretty vocal and uh, <laughs> so I think uh, it's a good community, uh, you know, it's a good tool for us. It's, it's been good, and I think any time that we can have an opportunity to kind of talk about some of these impacts with people, it, you know, it has a lot of visibility for us and helps to manage the one-off sort of questions that we get. So the other thing that, uh, that we did here that uh, was a good success for this year, at least I think, is um, I can remember as, uh, as a security professional um, coming from an apps background, attending OWASP um, conferences. I never thought I would present at OWASP conference, but here I am. Um, and it's just that, um, you know, how many times have we said, I wish that engineer, like, knew what I know? You know, what, you know why, don't, why don't they know the things that we know and, you know, value the things that we know and things? And so, so one of the things that I thought is, um, when I was there, is I started, I went to, of course, Java One, which is our event, and I did a, security session when I first, um, first was hired at Oracle. And I started, you know, sitting in on some of these different security sessions and realized that, wow, there's a lot of, like, topics about security at Java One. Um, so I said to the, um, to the events team, I said, hey, can we, uh, can we start a security track at Java One um, and just kind of see what happens? You know, if we call it what it is, maybe we'll stimulate some interest. And, and they said, uh, yeah, sure, as long as you want to lead the security track. And I said, uh, well, I don't know really anything about running a track, but um, I'll give it a shot. So I, um, anyway, so I reached out to my uh, friends network. So you might realize or recognize some of these names like Jim Manico, of course, legendary security hero here at OWASP. Um, Michael Coates, the OWASP president. I kind of reached out to some of these guys and said, hey, look, you know, these guys said yes. They're going to add a security track to, uh, to an engineering conference. Like, how can we... We have to like put some energy into this. How can we make this great for them? Um, you know, how can we get developers to pay attention? So they said, so I said, can you help me edit some some papers and things like that? And they said, sure. So everybody, so we all did that. We did you know paper review and things. Uh, but then they also said, hey, I'll do a, I'll do a session on this. And Michael said, I'll do a session on that. And and so um, in any case, it all worked out really well. And um, Surprisingly, uh, the turnout, I don't actually have the numbers on their sessions uh, quite yet, but, um, uh, but it was outstanding. In some places, um, just standing room only. So we brought the security conference to the developer conference. We're getting there. Progress. Um, we're going to, you know, and next year we'll have new things that we're going to talk about. Uh, and by the way, even if you're um, a security practitioner, uh, but you work with developers, uh, Java One is still an interesting place to go because there's, there's people like me and there's other OWASP people there. There are security vendors that go. Um, so if you're a security practitioner but charged with um, you know, trying to uh, work with uh, Java developers, it's a good, um, good resource for you. Um, so call to action, this is like different things that, um, that we can all do. Um, perhaps, you know, we've kind of focused a lot on Oracle and what we're doing, um, but there's a lot of things that other people can do to help prepare uh, and make their program safer. So this is kind of what we're going to talk about. So I had mentioned a little bit about our security journey for encouraging code signing and things like that. Um, so in a release that we have coming up here, 7U51 in January, um, we are gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make it so that um, self-signed and unsigned uh, applets are blocked by default. Um, so that's pretty significant. We, you know, one of the things that we've seen is any time that we change defaults to Java, um, there's a tremendous amount of uh, interest and feedback and things like that. Um, so we're continuing on that journey uh, in January and uh, and really moving to a model where um, you know, it's not mandated that everything must be signed. There's still some ways for you to, you know, say, adjust the security slider down to the medium level and, and get, um, you know, self-signed and unsigned to run. Um, but for anybody that makes no changes, this will be the new default. So code must be signed. Um, we also are requiring um, things like uh, manifest, certain manifest uh, permissions to be included as well, like um, the, 
the um, permission that defines whether it um, runs inside or outside the sandbox. You know, we've kind of taken some optimistic defaults uh, in through this transition period, but now we're kind of turning up the dials on that a bit as well. Um, so the impact here is basically any applets um, that's written before 7U25 uh, will not run by default. So you will have to take some sort of action in order to uh, have backward compatibility with older stuff. Thank you. Um, Self-signed for a known community, um, you know, that's the familiar practice of, um, you know, can I just like create my own CA within my company and then use my own certificates within your company? Of course you can. That's still allowed. We consider that safe. Um, Okay, so we talked a little bit about reporting vulnerabilities. If you have vulnerabilities that you want to share with us, things that you've um, spotted in Java, um, there's some information there where you can report it to our team and we'll take a look at it. Um, any new features, yeah, you can report them there or you can just send, them, uh, send me an email as well. Um, Java platform support, I mention this only because I'm not a sales guy, I don't get commissions, I work purely for an engineering team, but I get a million questions about support. So I do feel a little, uh, it is in my place to just say the options are there. Uh, if you want, you can investigate them. Uh, we do have a root certificate program in Java, so just like um, web browsers uh, for SSL um, that include roots, uh, which basically um, kind of uh, define the intrinsic trust, I guess, of what you would trust in your browser when you visit an SSL site. Java has um, roots that ship with, with Java as well. Uh, we also have a root program with um, documented public rules, and if you're a vendor and you want to participate, you can apply for it. These are the CPUs that I discussed earlier. So these are the dates that security patches will come out. Um, so there's no surprises. Um, so some things that you can do to be secure. Um, so you know, for end users, yeah, there are things that you can do. We had mentioned. Um, you know, old versions of Java are vulnerable. So keeping auto update on is, is helpful. It will help to keep you up to date, right? Um, uh, some people, you know, they don't like the pop-ups that happen. Sometimes they happen at, um, you know, the warning that a new version of Java is available interferes you as you're, you know, going to your YouTube cat video or something like that. Um, but you might want to pay attention to it. Um, you know, it is important. So leaving that service on, applying the patch at a, you know, perhaps a more opportune time will keep you safer. Um, practice defense in depth. You know, hardening your OSs, virus scanners, firewalls, things, things like that. Um, you know, a stronger Java is part of the solution. But um, you know, for uh, you know, a complete solution requires you know a more kind of uh, broader view of security controls, right? So for developers, um, a lot of things that they can do there too. Obviously, if you code your programs in a way, uh, there's sometimes some uh, secret mojo that uh, people use when they program that are um, you know, using libraries that are not um, supported and things like that can harm um, your um, public's uh, ability to upgrade, that people that use your products um, might get tied to a specific version of Java and things. An example of that would be like, say, you know, sun.star libraries or something. They're libraries that we ship with Java, but not really included in the Java spec. Um, you know, using those could harm your, uh, those that use your software, their ability to upgrade and tie them to a specific vulnerable version of Java. Sign your applications. Um, there's a lot of information out there about code signing. On our PM blog, we provide some information as well. Um, you might want to look at the time stamping feature. Um, it just uh, kind of lengthens the amount of time that your um, code signing is valid for. You know, certificates can kind of roll over a bit fast, and it's probably okay for SSL, but from a code signing perspective, you don't want to re-sign your code every year or even a couple of years, right? So, um, so time stamping can be helpful. You should look into that. OWASP top 10, you know, we're always looking at that. I think you should look at that too. Um, and then we also have, um, you know, kind of getting more into the Java trenches. Um, we have secure code lines for um, coding guidelines for the Java language that are available out there, as well as uh, CERT has 
uh, coding guidelines too. And I think that both are very complementary. Good resources. So these are the actual um, different references. Um, I just wanted to include them in the slide. So, okay, great, thank you. So that way, um, you know, if, um, you know, the deck is, uh, I think the decks are gonna be published. Um, you'll all have uh, access to what these things are and keep them handy. So that's really all I got for the presentation. Uh, at this time, um, maybe we'll just kind of close for a couple of questions. I think we have a few minutes if there's any um, questions that you'd have on Java platform security. Going once. Okay. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about that. I know people would like um, something that's more automated, less hands-on and things, and we're always um, discussing that internally because there's the other side of it where I don't want something silently, you know, running on my computer. That's, you know, um, so there's, there's a lot of opinions how the best way is to do that, but it's, it's something that keeps coming up, and I, you know, um, I think we should be looking at that. Um, we, but to kind of broaden the answer, I guess, we're looking at anything that would hurt um, the community's ability to uptake code fixes quickly, right? So, I mean, we know that if people aren't applying patches, well, it's because their software is incompatible or whatever. So we're going to try to do what we can from a vendor perspective to just allow you to make that change easily. We know if people could do it easy, they would do it. So, um, so whatever that is, if it's making... Um, something that's a little less hands-off, maybe we'll do that, um, or perhaps there's other options too. Next question. Right. Yeah. So we've talked about security journey. Well, we're not walking on that journey, okay? We're running. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the thing, there's, there's, you know, remediation tempo, features tempo is really hard, right? I mean, it'd be nice to just say, you know what, this is kind of tough stuff, let's just have a five-year plan to do this. Um, but the reality of it is, there's, you know, we're helping people defend assets out there, and, um, you know, there's bad guys out there that are exploiting these things, and so we, we're trying our best to find the right pace um, and we, it's not our goal to upset business, but we have to operate securely. We're, we're really balancing the two very finely. You know, we have the other side of the spectrum too, people that just want to use lambdas in eight. And you know what? They don't give a darn about applets. Applets are old school. So there's, we're balancing the concerns of an entire community. And it's, it is challenging. On, some, on the one hand, we go a little too fast for some and not fast enough for, for, for others. Yeah, good point. Um, so, uh, actually, I think Marianne discussed that a little bit. She kind of came back with some numbers. Um, I don't have the actual numbers on that, but one thing I can say is that the beginning part of our journey when I was hired aboard, we were constantly having security researchers um, tell us what the next vulnerability was. And, uh, you know, at this point, um, a lot of the vulnerabilities that we have in our queue are things that we've discovered. And I think, um, you know, perhaps, you know, why is that? Well, we have a lot of really smart people working on these things. Um, but I think um, part of it is, um, is the number of people who can find them and also, you know, how difficult it is to do. It's getting much more difficult. And, 
you know, smart people that can do these things and probably rather spend some time with their kids and playing World of Warcraft and Starcraft than digging into a Java virtual machine. Uh, I, think, um, I think part of that transition that we're, okay, yeah, I guess we're out of time. So I, maybe I'll just kind of finish up with that question up here if, it's, if I didn't get it quite. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you for attending and I hope you found it helpful.